Well, we still got a couple minutes yet. It says rotate your phone. You can't rotate your phone. But it says live. That's better than it did last I can make. There's a couple things happening. Uh, uh, one thing you may have seen on the the uh, members of the group page of our Wichita Audubon Facebook is uh, that uh, there's going to be a piece about the Chaplain Nature Center on Good Day Kansas tomorrow. That's on Channel 3 KSN at 1230. So tune in to see Sean talk about the Chaplain Nature Center. So I wanted to mention that, and then also um, our field trip for this month is the uh, birding the tropics at the Sedgwick County Zoo. So we do that one during the cold winter months, so we have a little bit of indoor birding there. So uh, that'll be this Saturday, 9.15 at the Sedgwick County Zoo, so come on out for that. Um, Sandra would like to make an announcement, so I'll turn it over to her. This is for all the longtime members of Audubon. Uh, you remember Martha Wewald? Uh, Bill Langley had a birding class, and uh, that's when I met uh, Julia Hoppus and Mary uh, uh, Wewald, Martha Wewald, and uh, a bunch of people, and we all became great friends. Well, Martha and I are the same age, and we became really good friends. She was really a character, but one-on-one, -on -one, she was the best friend you could have. And I, many times I visited her in, in Tucson, Arizona, after she left Wichita, and we went birding. And so we've always kept in touch, and we're the same age, so I, we always remember each other's birthdays. About a year and a half ago, I called her and couldn't get an answer, and I kept calling, and so I knew something was wrong. And about two months later, uh, she was really close with all of her neighbors. They'd come over for wine about four o'clock and all get together. And, and uh, in fact, I even met some of them. But um, they noticed her trash can was left out, and they went and investigated, and she had had a stroke. So by the time I found out, it was about two two months or so later. And I tried calling her, but uh, she was not able to communicate very well. So time went by, and then finally I thought, well, you know, we thought called and the place, the assisted living where she was, and they said she wasn't there anymore, so we thought she was deceased. Well, January 18th, this was a year and a half ago that she had the stroke. January 18th, I was making cream of celery soup. She always made that for me, and it was so good, I got a recipe. So I, it was the morning, and I was making cream of celery soup. Oh, I have to back up. I knew she had a brother named Max that lived in Oklahoma, so I thought, well, I'm going to try to find out just when she died and where she was buried and all that. So I found Max's address, and I, and I wrote him, and he did not answer me. This was way before Christmas. Well, I was making this cream of celery soup, 
And all of a sudden, January 18th, I got a call, and it was Max. And he said, Martha died today. So here she was for a year and a half, and I don't know who, I know her, her nephew was supposed to be taking care of her, so I don't know, I hope that he did a good job. I know there were problems with him, but anyway, so no one was visiting, none of her neighbors knew where she was, so we really felt pretty sad that a year and a half and people weren't visiting her or checking up and making sure that she was okay. But anyway, so that was, I had closure, because uh, we all wondered what, what happened to her. But Bill, we had the best time with your birding class. <laughs> he took us all over on Saturday in the Butler County van and just had a great time. So. Thank you, Sandra, for sharing that. I remember Martha when I first started in the late 90s. She would welcome everyone at the door with great enthusiasm and I wasn't quite sure what to think about what I was getting into when I when I first uh, uh, joined Audubon so uh, but she was a very enthusiastic person very uh, energetic and so I'll always remember that about her so okay well uh, I'll go ahead and introduce uh, our speaker for this evening uh, Rachel Roth is going to talk to us about the Cerrado uh, the grassland area in Brazil. Uh, of course, you remember her from uh, the Nature Center here. Uh, she's spent quite a bit of time here. Uh, also, she's a founding member of the Grassland Groupies, and so that's a grassland ad advocacy group, and I will let her tell you all about that. So here's Rachel. I think she might be ready. <laughs> well, I had it pulled up, and then I lost it to the ether here, so I'm not sure what's happened. Does anybody know any show tunes? <laughs> I do, but I'm distracted. <laughs> okay. Wow. Please do it on the correct side. Yeah. Oh. Okay, there we go. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm glad she got it because I didn't really Okay, after it. all that, I'm going to uh, take my mask off here so that I can speak into the microphone. Take a drink of water for good measure. <coughs> Chill that my water. <laughs> Um, and I guess introduce myself. So, hi, my name is Rachel. Um, I'm excited to, today to talk to you about the Cejado of uh, mostly Brazil in South America. Um, I uh, founded Grassland Groupies with uh, my, uh, I almost called you partner, but that has other implications, my uh, friend and uh, <laughs> nonprofit partner, Nicole. Um, and uh, our whole, thing is looking for the Kansases of the world that are so underappreciated and overexploited, uh, like Kansas and our Great Plains and uh, the Cejado. Uh, hello. The person lurking behind me in this photo is my younger brother, Skyler, and he's important to this story uh, because he married an amazing woman named Julie. And uh, my new sister-in-law is Brazilian. Uh, her family is from the Cejado, and because of that family connection, um, we had an opportunity to take a trip down to Brazil, which is where I first encountered uh, just how incredible this particular ecosystem is. Now, when we started out in Brazil, we were in Rio, and of course, uh, it is very tropical. Um, my brother is also a biology nerd, so that was the face we made the entire time we were in Brazil. Uh, but then, when it came time, halfway through our trip, to uh, head to Annapolis in Goiás and some of the surrounding areas in the state of Goiás, uh, we piled into a plane, we got a little bit split up, in fact, we had bets going on about which Americans would get lost. Um, eventually, I was the only one that did not get lost. So I was the surviving gringo, I'm happy to say, uh, from our trip. We did get the others back eventually. 
um, happy to say as well. But as we were kind of getting together and getting ready to start this next leg of our adventure, um, something really sticks out to me uh, about what my sister-in-law Julie said. She was like, okay guys, I know we've had an incredible time in the uh, beautiful forests of Rio and the beaches and it's been so amazing. This is not at all like that. <laughs> and she was like warning us, the entire group, about how, you know, this area isn't going to be anything like it at all. It's going to be kind of like urban and then, or rural rather. And uh, then she looked at me and she goes, oh, you know what, Rachel, you might actually really like this. It's kind of the Kansas of Brazil. Uh, and she was not wrong. Uh, this is a little bit of a snapshot from my first day in the Cejado, and to say that it reminds me of Kansas is such an understatement. It really felt in a strange way like coming home, and the only clue for me that I was in a completely different hemisphere was uh, the palm trees. <laughs> uh, even some of the animals were similar. Uh, there's one of the family members riding a horse corralling cattle up there. There were cattle egrets walking around in the fields of cattle. It, it was something else. Uh, pretty remarkable. Um, so that's when I first met uh, the Kansas of Brazil and had so many fun conversations with Julie's family on the farm talking about how incredible this landscape is and how underappreciated it often is um, within the country and outside of it too. And I related a lot to that, you know? We, we had some very long conversations, especially uh, one of her cousins, Daisy, about how, you know, if you're from this region, it means so much to you. You have such a personal connection. Like listening to her talk about the Cejado, felt like watching myself in a mirror talking about Kansas. It was such a cool experience. And uh, I'm hoping to give you a little piece of that today by talking about the Cejado and exactly what makes this ecosystem so unique and also so much like our home here in Kansas. So here's my plan for the day, um, or the evening rather. Uh, I'm gonna give you a snapshot of what exactly the Cejado is. Um, that is how, in Portuguese, you pronounce the double R, for the record. Um, if you say Cejado anywhere, people will be very confused, though, so it's okay if you keep calling it Cerrado. Uh, I will also talk about the diversity of this savanna, um, including some of my current favorite birds from the Cejado, ones which I met while I was there and also have learned are incredible, for various reasons. Um, I will talk about the ecology of this ecosystem and uh, end on some notes on the future in conservation. So first, let's look at the Cejado and find a snapshot about what this ecosystem exactly is. So first of all, uh, in the yellow there, you can see the outline of this savanna. It is the largest savanna in the neotropics. And by largest, I mean it is huge. It is two million. Uh, kilometers squared. Originally, of course, a lot of that mass has been reduced, but it still covers that same, you know, general landscape. It's just very fragmented, a lot like how the Great Plains is today. Um, originally, that makes it uh, three times the size of Texas. I've heard other uh, comparisons put it at like the size of Europe, basically, Western Europe. Um, it's a huge environment. And with that huge environment comes a huge range of diversity in what that ecosystem can look like. Uh, I would compare it to going from like the short grass to the tall grass prairie here in Kansas, but on a scale three times the size of Texas. So you can have just straight up open plains, variations on shrubby and woody uh, environments, uh, increasing tree presence to the point where the canopy can even be 90% at times. Um, which makes it kind of uh, weird for someone like me who's like, okay, where's the grassland in this and where does that line end? But for the ecoregion of the Cejado, um, the characteristic that makes it Cejado, a savanna, is that presence of an herbaceous layer. And there are some very unique e uh, habitat types within that ecosystem that might be more woody. I would compare that to maybe having riparian wooded areas 
here in Kansas that are naturally occurring in part of the environment. Uh, same sort of systems occur in Brazil in this environment. Uh, and here's generally how that is categorized. Um, you'll hear different people use different terms for these types. But there's this forested savanna, wooded savanna, which is quite open, and then like a woody grass savanna, where shrubs are still a huge part of this landscape. Woody plants are kings here and really do uh, define the habitats here. Um, but of course, the grass and herbaceous matter is very important too. Um, so a few things you need to know about the Cejado. Number one, it has incredible high diversity of life. Alone, it contributes 5% of all species to the world's biodiversity. So wiped from the map, that is a huge chunk of the life on the planet that is removed that's found nowhere else. Uh, second thing is high endemism. So that means that a lot of the things found in the Cejado are found literally nowhere else on the planet. Uh, an example that I thought was mind-boggling is that something like 80% of woody species are estimated to not be shared with any other savanna region. That is incredible. Um, the third thing I'm going to point out is that there's a lot of micro-endemism too. So even at very small spatial scales, the diversity levels in the Cejado is comparable to the Amazon rainforest. Uh, and a lot of those endemic species are only found in very, very small pieces of that Cejado. Uh, we'll mention a couple of those during the presentation. Uh, and I'm just going to scroll through some vistas that you might see that are all from the Cejado region. Here, of course, a lot of herbaceous matter, some nice, beautiful rocky landscapes, lots of trees. Uh, from above, showing off of palms, which are a huge part of the ecosystems there as well. Again, one of the clues that you're not in the, uh, Kansas, I guess. <laughs> um, here's a lot of very small trees. Notice how a lot of the woody plants are very skinny and narrow and kind of like um, almost desert looking, right? Um, and here's an example of some more forested type environments. There are a lot of mesic or like watery gallery forests that are found in the Cejado. And another characteristic uh, that is prevalent throughout the Cejado is that it's basically a natural orchard. I've heard the landscape described as a park or an orchard just naturally occurring because a lot of the woody plants that are here are brightly colored flowering plants that are producing tons and tons of fruit, which of course the birds absolutely love and so do the people from the Cejado. Speaking of which, there is also huge cultural diversity in the Cejado region. There is a rich mosaic of cultural heritage here. People have been living in the Cejado for at least 12,000 years. Uh, we have 216 indigenous territories in that region, 83 ethnic groups, um, and the Tupi people are, I've got a, a chief picture here. Um, they're just a, one of those groups, one small example of an indigenous group from this region. Um, and a lot of the names of the plants and animals there today still bear indigenous names. So let's dive into the ecological diversity of the Cejado and look at what exactly lives in there. Um, here's just a little snapshot. And a lot of these things are quite familiar faces from zoos and uh, other, other things like that. And a nice little snapshot on the right there of all the various flowering plants that can be found only in that region. Um, <laughs> I'm a fan of uh, like, paleontology and archaeology, and there's a reason why so many of the animals and plants living here are so unique. It's because basically since the extinction of the dinosaurs, um, South America as a continent has been an island, uh, evolving amongst itself and cut off from every other part of the world. So 66 million years ago, it was connected to Australia through Antarctica, 50 million years ago, Australia got disconnected, so it's just South America and Antarctica hanging out. Um, and then 34 million years ago, Antarctica completely disconnects and glaciates. So whatever 
uh, was present <laughs> in that uh, continent is, is for the most part kind of wiped out. Um, and so from then on, it was truly isolated from the rest of the world. And that's why, again, in the Amazon rainforest, other biomes in South America, it's incredibly unique. Um, about nine million years ago, islands began forming around the Isthmus of Panama. And then by about three million years ago, uh, there was a solid land connection between the continents. So the Great American Interchange sure helped some diversity spread between our two continents. Um, but apart from that, it was isolated to have a nice little petri dish of uh, evolution. Oh, there's an island. Nice. <laughs> so here's a few animals that you might recognize that are from, let's say, Hilo. I'm going to start with some iconic animals like the giant anteater. Uh, termites are prevalent, especially in particular parts of the Cejado. So this guy is one of the surviving megafauna. Uh, historically, there were a lot of giant sloths and other giant creatures. The maned wolf, another iconic animal of the Cejado. Nothing like it on the planet. Its nearest relatives are now extinct and used to live in other parts of South America. Also smells very strongly, which will be a theme for some reason in South America. Um, another couple of iconic animals, the giant armadillo, which is not the most giant armadillo that has ever lived there, uh, but it's the current giantest armadillo that lives there. And the jaguar, which of course is not only found in the Cejado, but is found in that region and uh, uses the Cejado, like a lot of other animals do, as sort of a connection point between all of the other habitats around it, like the Pantanal. And uh, the, I guess the Amazon rainforest, my brain just blue screened there, and I was trying to think of the Katinga as the other one I was thinking of. Um, yeah, uh, some iconic bird life that you might recognize. Uh, the Rhea is from the Cejado. Toco toucans, uh, they are being chased by some kiskitties over there. See, it's got a baby in its mouth. I'm kind of on like a smear campaign for toucans because they are jerks. And I think it's beautiful, but I just want everybody to know that. Um, uh, and the hyacinth macaw is endemic to uh, the Cejado. So that's a pretty iconic, uh, vulnerable bird. And of course, a couple examples of endemic bird life. I know some of you have been to the Cejado. Um, I don't know if these are any birds that you have had a chance to see, but they are ones that, oh, oops, oops, oh my, uh, that stood out to me. One is the banana ant bird. I know uh, several of our Audubon folks have shared ant birds with us before. The crimson fronted cardinal, which is beautiful. Uh, the goyaz parakeet and the Minas Gerais terranulet, which is one of the micro-endemics um, that's found in only a very specific habitat type in the Cejado. And this little guy, who I just think is delightful, it is the blue-eyed dove, which is a critically endangered species endemic to the Cejado. And look at those colors, the blue, I've never seen such a vibrant blue. It's like hyacinth macabre in little splashes, it's gorgeous. Um, there's also a startling number of familiar bird life species in the Cejado. Oh my, I just got excited ahead of myself. Um, upland sandpipers have recently been discovered to overwinter in the Cejado. Most of them go to Argentina and hang out in the Pampas, but uh, there, since I think 2017, we discovered that there are some that hang out in the Cejado over the winter. Um, birds like black crowned night herons, when they disappear in our uh, winter, are hanging out in uh, the Cejado, sometimes in city parks. Boy, that sounds familiar. A couple of other ones, buff-breasted sandpipers hang out in the Cejado, and so do burrowing owls. And um, burrowing owl was one of the first birds that I saw and did a double take on when I was in the Cejado because I saw it in a city park in the capital, and it was just kind of hanging out on a light pole, and I was like, there's no way I'm seeing a burrowing owl on a light pole in a city park in Brazil, right? Like that kid, like it had to be some similar animal. And then as we kept walking, I saw this sign in the city park <laughs> for the Caruja Brachiera, uh, scientific name, Athene cunicularia. It is literally a burrowing owl, and it's so common in the city park that they had a sign for it there. 
Um, so that was uh, brilliant to see. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the full range of these guys, they are residents in a huge part of South America and uh, apparently are not afraid of city parks. Um, for anybody who is interested in birding in Brazil, uh, I'm going to recommend a birding website to you called Wiki Aves. It is approved by my birding buddy, Andre. Thanks, Andre, for this pro tip. This is basically the Brazilian e-bird, so there are local sightings of birds, as well as species accounts for all the birds. It's all in Portuguese, but Google does a fairly decent job of translating. I say fairly decent. It calls every chick a puppy, which I think is adorable. Um, but I think otherwise it gets the idea across. So that's fine. Wiki obvious. So here I'm going to uh, take a moment to dive into my top three say how to birds for today. Um, it's because, you know, every time you learn a new bird, I think it becomes my new favorite. It's impossible to not like a new bird that you learn about because you always are like, wow. You're incredible. I love you and I would die for you. Um, so this is just the birds that I picked for today um, because it can't possibly describe to you in detail every single species that can be found here. Um, I will note for anybody who listens to the podcast that Nicole and I do that I have stricken the buff breasted uh, uh, the buff necked ibis from this list because I just did a whole episode about them, but it is still up there in my top three or four, so. Sorry, buff-necked ibis, you're going to have to hang out and I'll talk about you another time. Um, first of all, I wanted to talk about the South American burrowing owls because I had a lot of questions um, about how their life history differs from burrowing owls in Kansas. And what really struck me is that even in like the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's Birds of the World page on burrowing owls, they don't really talk about it outside of the Americas. Uh, or, or sorry, outside of North America. And um, so they mentioned that it can be found everywhere else, but I was like, are they hanging out there all the time? Do any of them move around and migrate at all? Are some of the ones from further north going way south? Like, what are the different subspecies doing? How do they live? They don't have prairie dogs, so what, do they still sound like prairie dogs? I had so many questions. Um, so to answer the first one that I had, where do they live without prairie dogs? They just find other holes. Um, or they dig their own holes. The uh, male and female will take turns excavating uh, something like two meters horizontally sometimes, uh, either in termite mounds or in uh, armadillo holes. Or if there's not a hole there already, uh, especially in coastal areas, they will just start the hole themselves and dig it with their beak and their talons which I think is very interesting. Also, sometimes the Brazilian burrowing owl takes on a nice reddish hue. Uh, and that's not a natural coloration unless, I mean, I guess dirt is natural, but you know what I mean, uh, that is dirt. But otherwise their life history is very similar to our burrowing owls. They sound like our burrowing owls, which sounds a lot like prairie dogs and rattlesnakes. Even Wiki Ave describes them as sounding like those things. Um, so it's such an interesting idea to me that these guys developed all these traits in North America and I guess just took it down into South America with them and it keeps working for them. Uh, they also tend to be fairly community oriented. They will set up little colonies and uh, bark at danger uh, to each other, which sounds a little bit familiar. Um, so here is my favorite regional burrowing owl names. It's a ranked list because I think this is very fun. Um, these are all the different names, uh, well not all of them, these are a few of the names uh, given to this bird uh, in Brazil and other regions in South America. Uh, the first one, my favorite, Owl of the Hole. It's perfect. You can't ask for a better name. Uh, number two, Cockroach Owl. That just made me laugh. Uh, number three, Owl Miner. I like that idea a lot. It gives me a good visual. I want to give them all tiny hard hats. Number four, Termite Owl. It's great. Uh, number five, Owl of the Field, very to the point. Uh, and then Capotinia, which is actually maybe my favorite. I put it as number six because I wanted to say it last because it's really cute, but it means little bonnet and it's just such a cute little name. Capotinia, what a good name for a burrowing owl. Uh, and like I mentioned, there are several subspecies 
of the burrowing owl, uh, well, a lot of subspecies of burrowing owl found in South America. Two of the more common ones in Brazil are the southern burrowing owl and the Brazilian burrowing owl. I honestly don't know the difference between them. I just thought it was interesting to note. And uh, we have subspecies here in North America too, if you are a traveler, that might be an interesting thing to look into. So these guys are very regional and they do not migrate. And uh, they're just as great as they are up here. I love them. Oh, also they're very photogenic. So these are, <laughs> these are like the first selections of photos from submissions and people on Wikiaves. And I just got a kick out of it because every single one of them is gold mid-barfing a pellet. This guy looks like he's been caught in the act of a crime. I love it. Uh, okay, next up we have the red-legged Syriana, which one of my top birds of all time, not going to lie. Uh, this is very, very iconic for savanna areas. Uh, you might recognize it better uh, in its erect standing position because that's mostly what it does. It runs along the ground, it can reach speeds of up to 50 kilometers an hour, and really will only fly if pressed. Like if you are harassing this thing and you, it cannot get away from you, it might fly for a short burst, but otherwise it is a running bird. And its name, uh, both Seriama and its scientific name, which is uh, Kariyama, I guess is how you would pronounce it in Latin, are from Tupi origins. So it's an indigenous name, Sariyama, uh, and I forget what it means. I had it in my notes, which I cannot see. Uh, I think it was something like, um, it was a reference to the crest. I don't remember the exact wordage of it. Um, but that's the, the Seriama. Uh, they are a carnivorous bird, too, and this is where things get really interesting for this guy. Uh, of course, they will catch and eat just about anything. Uh, what makes their carnivorous habits most interesting is how they dispatch their prey, which is actually how we know that the Seriema is the last terror bird on the planet. Digest that for a moment. It's a lot to take in, I know. Uh, if you're not familiar with terror birds, where have you been? Uh, if you are, this is one of them. Uh, they are literally a terror bird. Taxonomically, they are in the same group as them, which is distinct from all other birds on the planet. Uh, they used to be horribly ferocious beasts that prowled the grasslands, uh, eating horses, as you can see. And uh, number A up there, that is not a number, letter A up there, is the red-legged Syriama, which is uh, the, the last one that we have that still exists. Um, morphologically, we kind of know this because of the uh, prey dispatching methods. I had to show this bird in action because they're so built for running. Look at him go. And that's like, he's not even trying, you know what I mean? He's just kind of relaxing his way through a nice, like, pleasant jog. Imagine that thing being taller than us. Okay, now watch this. That is a, that is a toy. But... Yeah, it's like a, a hatching motion that they do. Uh, and... Watch him do it again. Get it. Um, a lot of uh, animal trainers who work in zoos that have these guys as educational animals will train them to do that on command. I actually have a video of that so we can watch him just do it over and over again. Oh, it's so good. Um, <laughs> so we're just going to keep watching him uh, hatch this uh, toy alligator. So good. <laughs> I had to think I was going to say, but I got distracted. Okay, don't look at the screen. You can, I'm not going to. Uh, this is such a unique characteristic, and the bones in the neck and the way that they articulate with the muscles of the neck that allow them to do this is something that no other bird has on the planet except terror birds. So really in-depth morphological studies of those two different groups have shown just how uh, incredible that connection is and how strong that connection is and how unique this behavior is for birds um, makes me appreciate them so much. He only gets treats when he hits the rock with it. He has to have good aim. 
So yeah, that is the red-legged Sayama. Like I said, they'll eat anything. I even saw them outside of a uh, reserve eating bread that the guy who owned the place was handing out to them. I don't think that's recommended, obviously, but they will eat things that are not meat, uh, especially when resources are low. What a cool bird. What's he being trained for? Oh, uh, he's an animal ambassador, so he's being trained to do that behavior. I think that this bird, I have it muted, but the bird has some sort of disability with his vision that makes it difficult for him to aim, so he's being rewarded for aiming against the rock. And uh, she's doing a demonstration with some folks there. Okay, last but not least, the white anu, or uh, the guirakuku, which is like such a cool bird. I, I met these birds when I was in Brazil and I was like, oh, they're so cool. There's like six of them in a tree, like hanging out together. What a neat bird. And they are incredibly social and gregarious birds. Um, here you can see in winter, they huddle up, they will form dense lines. Uh, they will position their feathers just so to like overlap with each other to share and conserve heat best. Um, I read a description that uh, often when they're roosting at night in tight lines, other birds will like run across the backs of the others to try and get in the middle, which I think is an adorable point. Um, they can die of cold in the winter, and it does not get cold in the winter. So uh, that is incredible too, and, and it's very important for them to conserve heat. Um, but like I said, they're very social birds. They're also predatory birds. I guess I think predators are the best right now, currently. Um, they hunt all kinds of other animals, including birds and other things not pictured. And being so social, they tend to hide out, or hang out rather, in groups of like six to eight uh, in the summer. In winter, they can approach groups of like 20 in number. They also are communal nesters, which is very cool. So in addition to sharing everything that they do, uh, they are known to dump tons of eggs into one nest and kind of share the responsibility of raising so many young, which is incredible. Uh, now this bird is a cuckoo, and for those of you familiar with Anis, they are related to Anis within the cuckoo family. So uh, cuckoos have some strange nesting behaviors that include a lot of egg dumping. But what I didn't realize is that although this bird seems on the surface to be very cute and innocent and sweet and social, and that is definitely the problem with anthropomorphizing animals, right? Because my instinct is, oh my gosh, they're so cute. It turns out that communal nest is a bloodbath, and it is not cute. <laughs> um, and it's not just like the chicks killing each other, it, the parents will kill them too. So it's like a communal nesting situation full of murder, which is fascinating. Um, also, everything is terrified of them. For example, uh, several species of dove. This one's called the cowgirl dove, which I think is very cute. Um, if a weird cuckoo shows up, it just leaves. They leave. They don't even stick around at all. Um, hawks get bullied. The, <laughs> the uh, wiki obvious page for this bird said that they will attack harpy eagles. And I couldn't find another resource for that, and so I'm not sure if that was a mistranslation, because they did link to this specific hawk after that, but I choose to believe it. Um, so hawks get bullied, burrowing owls targeted, they are enemies of the burrowing owls, those cute little nestlings murdered, they are done for. Vampire bats attracted. What? Yeah, so it turns out um, they're very odorous, which is also true of other Anis. And the odor that they exude from their bodies is so powerful and pungent that it can be smelled from meters away by people. And it is known to attract specifically vampire bats and also other carnivores. Um, also, in case you forgot already, they travel in packs. So um, there are just gangs of them running around, smelling absolutely awful, calling down vampire bats from the sky. And I just think that's so metal. So the too long don't listen to what I just said of this <laughs> is that the Guir Cuckoo is a nightmarish gang. Uh, the way they melt together visually to make one five-headed bird really should have been a clue to us from the beginning, is what I'm gonna say. 
uh, and they are coming to murder babies and call down the vampire bats upon us all. What a fantastic bird. Um, I don't think it can get much better than that personally. I love them. I would die for that bird. Okay, <laughs> so moving on. Uh, let's talk about more generally the Cejado's uh, ecology, because this is where it starts to look pretty similar to Kansas as well. It's a lot of very different species, but the way that they work together is a lot like our home. So we're gonna talk about their ecosystem drivers because any grassland, like our grasslands here, are ultimately driven by things that disturb the grasses, that cause trees to stop growing uh, or to be eliminated in certain ways, that allows an herbaceous material to be there. In the case of the Cejado, those elements are drought, so the ecosystem has to survive months of arid conditions. It has to survive fire, um, regular fire events. And finally, flooding. Although this isn't prevalent across the Cejado, there are specific types of Cejado habitats where flooding really does carve the way the landscape looks and even kills back more trees to create broader plains. So starting out with drought, this is a very interesting point for the Cejado because it is also the most humid tropical savanna. It is wet in the Cejado, um, but it depends on what time of the year. So in the austral summer, that would be October through April in this example that I have, tons of rain gets dumped into the Cejado. 43 to 63 inches of water uh, is the average. To put that in perspective, Kansas gets, I think, 20 to 45 inches, depending on where you are in Kansas, uh, for the entire year. So that's all being dumped during the austral summer or the southern hemispheric summer. Now, during the austral winter, so May through November or so, it is dry and as arid as a desert at times. Uh, it's about a five month dry period that they have. And so that really shapes the way that these plants and animals interact in this environment. So a lot of plants are adapted to drought. I pointed out that a lot of the plants look rather xeric or deserty. Um, there's several species that look quite deserty from uh, uh, further away, um, but even having deep roots and things like that are a huge part of the Cejado. Um, here is a specific type of forest in the Cejado called the Cejadao, and that is where the Minas Gerais Terenulet is from. It's a very narrow region of specifically arid or desert adapted forests that is found in a specific part of the Cejado. Um, so even in this habitat type where it is very dense canopy, all of these trees are very narrow and adapted for dry conditions. Um, water is extremely important to the Cejado, and I don't think it's easy to uh, overestimate that. It has been called the birthplace of waters because uh, a lot of the, I can't see the exact number, so I apologize, uh, but a lot of the river systems uh, in South America uh, have their origin, their source in the Cejado. And the Cejado is connected to, I think, three of the major uh, aquifers that are found in Brazil. So the Cejado support, supports a wide network of rivers and aquifers that supply important hydrographic basins of Brazil and beyond. Uh, this is also important for like power reasons. A lot of the electricity in this region is generated by hydropower. So uh, water levels are very important. Uh, here is one example, the Sao Francisco River, which is a huge river in Brazil. This is the source of the river up in the Cejado. So the plants living in the Cejado are adapted to those dry conditions and those wet conditions. It's been described as an upside down forest, which for those of us who know Kansas well will sound very familiar. The roots of Cejado plants uh, travel incredibly deep, and these are woody plants as well. In fact, uh, about 70% on average of the Cejado's biomass is underground. Again, that sounds very familiar. Um, 
Because of this, all of the plants that are adapted to the Cejado region basically function like a natural water pump. So in the months when it's incredibly wet, all of those deep roots and the water storage systems in the plants themselves are helping to let the water penetrate deep into the groundwater layers and recharge the aquifers and keep the ground moist. It stops runoff and waste of water from happening and allows it to really be charged deep in the soil in order to survive the dry months. On the other hand, when it's incredibly dry, those roots are so deep that they're tapping into those very deep layers of water, tapping into those stored uh, reserves, and then bringing it up into the top layers of the soil, essentially redistributing water depending on which season it is in order to keep all the other plants and the ground in general moist and full of those water reserves. So that is an incredible ecological uh, function of these native vegetations, um, which of course is devastating to lose, which is what's happening. Um, the problem with a lot of these plants being lost is that as you deforest things, that actually decreases rainfall. So a lot of our rain water comes from uh, water evaporating from plants, right? So you decrease the rain. Um, there's been increased irrigation use. I think Brazil's water needs have increased by 80%, and a majority of that is from agribusinesses, so commercial farming and things like that. Uh, so that's leading to aquifer depletion. And uh, of course, replacing native vegetation with monocultures, as we are all familiar with, diminishes that groundwater recharge because you're removing that essential function of the ecosystem. All of these things together spell a pretty big disaster waiting to happen and actually currently happening for Brazil and its water needs, not only for the ecosystems, but the people that rely on those huge aquifers in order to thrive. Okay, second is fire. And fire is actually a huge part of the Cejado, just like it is here in Kansas. Um, I think I have seen my friends use almost these exact same rubber stoppers to stop fires <laughs> here in Kansas. Um, so prescribed burning does happen in the Cejado, and the plants that are there are adapted to fire recovery. A um, couple of examples of some fire events here for you, not that we need too much imagination. It is a little startling to me how, uh, you know, being here in Kansas, we always mow the sides of our highways and stuff. The grass is allowed to be quite tall on the sides of the road in Brazil. So some fire adaptations. A lot of the plants in the Cejado have very thick, corky bark, like pictured up in that top plant. That's very familiar to us. We even have savanna trees here in Kansas, like the bur oak, that have incredibly thick, corky bark to provide insulation from the heat of the fire that would otherwise damage the plants. Um, they have specialized organs. Uh, I think it's called a xylopodia. So on this D plant here on the black background, that is an underground stem that's modified to store water and nutrients to help this plant recover from a fire event. Um, in addition, a lot of blooming events are started by fires and allow the germination of a lot of plants in the Cejado. Uh, and like I mentioned before, 70% of the Cejado biomass is underground, and that's not only for the water, and it's not only roots, a lot of it is underground stems, just like we see here in Kansas, because these plants know that they're going to have to bounce back from fire, or they've adapted to that, rather. Um, a few more images just to give you a nice picture. Um, some more of that thick, corky bark. Uh, thick, leathery leaves that are resistant not only to fire, but to loss of water. Um, and uh, when you have these huge fires, it leads to massive blooming events, like pictured in the, the bottom corner here. And actually, by current estimations, the Cejado is currently being underburned. It's not being burned as often as it probably should be. Um, I think uh, sometimes when discussing the fires happening in Brazil, uh, obviously the Amazon is being burned down to create room for pastures. Um, Cejado burning uh, is part of the natural ecology and needs to be implemented more. So that's something that folks there are working on. 
Um, sometimes the fires trigger the blooming uh, in different ways too. So in this first plant here, uh, its blooming event is triggered one day after a fire occurs. Uh, the plant picture on the right is a month after fire occurs is when it begins to bloom. So it's actually starting to, to grow a little bit of the plant's body before it blooms. Cool. Um, and of course, uh, the re-sprouting events too. So depending on how hot the fire is, which part of the Cejado the plant is in, um, they might either totally survive if it's not a really intense fire and be able to regrow from uh, the air where the plant stopped growing before, or if the top of the plant gets completely killed off, it can always sprout from the ground. Again, very familiar. Finally, floods do shape parts of the landscape. In fact, this is a really specific habitat type called Campos Verdas, which is kind of iconic in the region. Uh, basically, the flooding event kills back all of the trees except for these specific palm trees. Um, I believe that they're Viridi palms, which is uh, endemic to the region. And these sort of pathways, which is what Campos Verdas means, uh, it's like a, a pathway field, basically, um, are pretty iconic too and form corridors not only for people but for a lot of the wildlife that travels there. Um, flooding events also shape, uh, here's a, sorry, a, a compost verdas with, with water occurring there, so that line of palms is being shaped by that flooding event in this picture, whereas it was absent, the water was absent before. Um, so flooding events are also important for shaping habitats of animals like the blue-throated macaw, which is critically endangered. And uh, it lives in some pretty interesting wetlands that are sort of like grassy uh, plains, which where again, the, the trees are largely being killed back by floods. So that's a pretty cool component of that ecosystem. Okay, and finally, some notes on the future of the Cejado, which always is hard to talk about when you really love something and it's in danger. So I'll try my best not to be depressing and to end on some positive notes. <laughs> um, but you know, I think a lot of us are seeing this kind of on a global scale where um, a lot of the, the ecological needs are being sidelined for uh, economic needs. And often these things tend to be a little bit short-sighted. In the case of the Cejado, uh, it could be devastating for the future of Brazil. So of course there's been degradation of habitat. Here's some different stages of degradation of Cejado by the capital Anopolis. Um, the biggest threats uh, are agribusiness, especially soybean production. Of course there's other reasons why deforestation is happening, but the recent huge uptick in deforestation is mostly from the boom in soybean production. Um, the deforestation is a huge threat, primarily because the more things are deforested, it kind of creates that positive feedback loop, right, where you lose rainfall and then you're not recharging the groundwater systems as much, and it's also deforested, so that prevents some groundwater recharging, and it just keeps getting worse and worse, uh, and it's difficult to remedy once a certain threshold has been passed. Uh, and of course, climate change in general threatens the entire water fountain of Brazil uh, and compounds all of these issues. So those are the, the current biggest threats. Uh, in Brazil's national plan for adaptation to climate change, they do mention the Cejado specifically and, and cite some studies there on what's expected to happen. So modeling projections performed for the plan Publish predictions that say how might experience a reduction in precipitation of 35 to 45% by the end of the century, and that the regional temperature might increase by up to five to five and a half degrees Celsius. Um, say how deforestation may increase the duration of the dry season from five to six months. That is not an insignificant change um, that is projected to occur. Um, and part of the problem is that the Cejado right now is kind of considered the last agricultural frontier in Brazil. And, you know, it, as human ingenuity and our uh, sciences improve over time, we're always finding ways to exploit things that for, before were uh, protected, right? Uh, here in Kansas, the Flint Hills survived because the limestone meant we couldn't plow it. Uh, today, 
our technological advances mean that it is being mined for limestone, the thing that protected it before. In the Cejado, uh, it was really acidic soils that had protected the Cejado from being plowed before. Uh, it was rangeland, but that was its most productive use. Uh, now, uh, soil chemistry advances mean that people are completely changing the soil chemistry in fields on a broad scale in order to produce crops, which also has a lot of other implications there. So now that it's kind of open and it can be made uh, a lot more habitable for crops, it is the, the last agricultural frontier. And uh, a lot of the deforestation that's been happening in the Cejado, unlike the Amazon where all of that deforestation is illegal, the Cejado it's all legal. Um, you know, it's private owners converting their land to uh, produce cash crops which is a needed economic benefit for those people and is being promoted by leadership in the country, um, but at a cost that might be too fast to really comprehend. So here's a little bit of good news, um, and most of it involves soy since that's the current uh, threat that's the biggest for the Cejado. Um, there has been a soy moratori moratorium, excuse me, uh, which was a huge call to uh, address these issues with the Amazon. But in 2019, they expanded that moratorium to include the Cejado. So there's a lot of uh, movement happening with that, uh, which includes a round table on responsible soy. So now sources of soy are being tracked and documented, as well as whether uh, they are coming from places that have been deforested to produce that soy. There's a lot of information that I could give you, um, but if you're interested in learning more about that, I put a link up here to my Direct Me page where I have a folder of links for information like this. So direct.me slash lilbluestem. Um, if you want some more information on those soy moratoriums and the kinds of places that are using credits and other factors to try and encourage through commercial means uh, sustainable soy practices. Um, and you know, <laughs> Uh, it, it is it is really sad. Um, so between 2014 and 2021, I, there's been a huge drought the last couple of years in Brazil. It's been really impacting things. Uh, the Iguazu Falls uh, is in Argentina. It is one of those rivers that is fed by the Cejado. Um, and last year, uh, water levels were again very, very, very low. And it is very sad. Well, I said I was gonna try and be depressing and here I am being very depressing, so I'm sorry about that, but you know, conservation. <laughs> um, the Cejado is richer than most of the world's forest and yet deforestation last year was pretty high. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that until recently there hasn't been a lot of education about the Cejado and a lot of people haven't realized how valuable and protected it is. And I think that story is told in the headlines too. A lot of them read things like the Cejado's, uh, or sorry, the Amazon's ugly little sister or the ugly duckling of Brazil. And it's kind of viewed as, you know, by some people, as something that is, you know, not that special. It's just disorganized fields and nothing worth protecting. Um, but as the Museo de Cejado, excuse me, said, anyone who knows the Cejado falls in love. So that's definitely true for me. And it's definitely true for the people that I know that are part of my family that live in the Cejado and really, really love the Cejado in a way that I relate to so much. And I hope you guys also maybe love the Cejado a little bit more now and really appreciate how incredible this huge, diverse ecosystem is, which thankfully, is being recognized on a global scale now. And uh, this is just one step out of many steps across the globe toward a really necessary awareness of how important our grassland ecosystems are.
cool. That's all I had. Holy cow, I should have found something way more upbeat. We can talk about vampire bats sending in the sky again. But <laughs> uh, thank you. I got my information out there. I will answer questions. Such an interesting point. I have no idea. I really would be interested to know how that compares. Yeah. yeah. I have to imagine the scope of that biome has a lot to do with how much stuff they are able to have there. Um, but again, in, in addition, it's just been so isolated over time that that's why, especially the plants, are so unique. Animals spread a lot easier than plants. So we've had a lot of like marsupial crossovers and armadillo crossovers and stuff, but not the plants. Yeah? So, not to say just, but the main threat of the climate change is deforestation. If they don't have like <laughs> mineral extraction or they're not worried about mineral extraction or some of these other things, or are they? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. There are certainly other causes of deforestation. Um, right now, the huge increase that we're seeing that is alarming ecologists in Brazil has to do directly with soy production. It's just such a valuable crop, and now that it can be produced in, in this region in South America, it's causing a lot of the deforestation to happen. Um, I should have also mentioned, although I, I lost the graphic, I think that's why I didn't put it in here, um, there, there is a big movement trying to find the most efficient ways to take land that's already in production but maybe not effective or it's already been cleared but it's not being used for soy production. So ways that we can increase soy production in Brazil without deforesting things and that would be such a good thing uh, to do. It just requires a lot of top-down implementation of ideas and uh, it's kind of hard for systems of government to implement those kinds of changes when they don't think that there's a problem happening in the first place. So I think that's their current problem that, that it, they're facing. But the good news is a lot of the people there really care about their landscape and they are pushing very hard to make these changes. And they have a lot of support from ecological groups. Yeah. Did you uh, visit the falls? I did not. I didn't go to Argentina. Um, we saw a lot of falls because there's a lot of water in Brazil, um, but I did not visit those. Well, I saw it many, many years ago, but we went into uh, Brazil. I was doing an Argentina trip, and we did go into Brazil, so part of it must be in Brazil. Uh, Might be. I, I really want to go to Argentina. I think like Argentina and Mongolia are my next grasslands on my list because Mo Mongolia is like a whole other, like that is what a cool ecosystem. Um, but uh, the Argentina grasslands, I mean, that's like where a lot of our Kansas birds go. It's very plainsy and they have like South American meadowlarks that are like black and red and oh, they're so cool. Um, I, there's a lot going on in Argentina. To see. I'm looking at Nicole because I'm expecting that I'll drag her along with me too. <laughs> Possibly other people too. But yeah. Any questions? Alan. Okay, so the white anu, you mentioned that it smells strong enough that it attracts carnivores, <coughs> including vampire bats. Correct. Why? What is uh, the what is the evolutionary benefit of attracting carnivores to yourself by how powerful you smell? I have no idea because carnivores eat them. Uh -huh. Like there's, I mean, boa constrictors will eat them, larger birds of prey will eat them, I mean, they'll fight back, I mean, it's kind of like king birds, you know, like, the other things can totally eat them, but that doesn't stop their mean-spirited attitude, right? Um, the only, the only logical conclusion uh, for why the white anu, the gira cuckoo, smells so strongly, to me, the only logical explanation, is that it's to strike fear in the hearts of their enemies. <laughs> Um, but that's pure speculation. I think we'd have to do some studies on that probably to really get to the bottom of it. But it is something that a lot of other Anis share in common, having a strong odor. Do, do the cuckoos eat the vampire rats? I don't know. I think that they, I mean, they're diurnal, so 
they're not really adapted to be out and active at night. So, I mean, maybe in like that sort of twilight period of time, I can see maybe like a vampire bat like swooping down or something and it just kind of like grabs it. I, I don't know. I, I think that if this bird is willing to fight so many other things, uh, that it would be willing to fight and eat a vampire bat that just happened to be hanging out. Seems logical to me. Question. Um, so, if, if you didn't hear, he, he wondered uh, how that land conversion exactly is, is happening and whether some of it's being converted to pasture use and that sort of thing. And it's, it is a mixture of both. Um, I mean, the Amazon is being cleared for cattle ranching. The Cejado is also being cleared for cattle ranching. A lot of the habitat types that are there are not really good for giant cows walking around. Uh, so a lot of that gets cleared too. Um, and some of the regions that have been deemed suitable for soy production in the Cejado are things that have already been cleared for ranching in the past. Uh, so it has certainly happened historically and I think historically was the bigger problem. Um, really the swing has come from the soil chemistry aspect solving the age old problem of the soil killing all of the crops that was protecting it before. So um, I, it's probably still happening. Uh, I wouldn't know the, the percentages off the top of my head, but it's, I mean, there's always a lot going on, right? Like we talked about mining earlier and certainly mining is an issue in Brazil too. It's just the extent to which it's a problem on the broader scale. So, cool. Uh, one more. Okay. Uh, your brother still live there? Are you going back? He doesn't live there right now. He lives in Texas right now. Um, my sister-in-law lived in Rio for a little while by herself, which cracks me up because her mom thought that was horrible and was so worried for her. Um, but uh, I think that they are interested in moving to Brazil in the future. She's currently studying international affairs, or she just got a degree in international affairs. My brother is finishing up a degree, a graduate degree, a uh, master's in, um, it's an environmental degree. I think it has to do with energy production. So I think that they would like to move to Brazil long term uh, at some point in the future. My mom is so concerned about that. <laughs> but I'm excited because I'll have an excuse to go travel. If you have an opportunity, by the way, to ever travel with somebody who speaks Portuguese, that is the way to do it because you can just say, hey, I'm the gringo. Please talk to my sister-in-law. <laughs> so good. Cool. Well, oh uh, yeah, Jim. Well, for whatever it might be worth, and the map I found is not too definitive, but I believe that the border between Brazil and Argentina is on the Iguazu River, and the falls seems to be shared again. The falls is shared between Brazil and Argentina.